number is uh, 1024 for the uh, uh, info. Um, and today we have a special guest. This is Michelle Dong, uh, and he is going to talk a little bit about what it's like to actually have a job in data science. Uh, she happens to work for Spark, uh, but I don't want to take too much work under, so I'm not going to tell too much more of the story. Um, are there any questions before she gets started? Yeah. One K. Any others? All right. Cool. Good. Yep. All right. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Like. Um, do you want the mic? If you want to be a little louder, then you'll be able to be heard. Sure. You can use a body mic, or there should be a There's stick. That one, but. Oh yeah, uh, that one works really well. You just stick it in your pocket and just clip it. You might clip it higher, better sound. Yeah, and then power switches here. Hello. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm. I'm. Not, I wasn't a camp counselor, so my voice doesn't <laughs> go all the way back. Um, but thank you for the introduction. So, like Langdon said, I'm Michelle uh, Vong. I work as a data science solutions engineer at Spark. Um, Langdon is my manager. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'm here today to talk a little bit about um, what I do at Spark, um, one of the projects I've been working on, um, just a little bit about, a, a bit about my background and what I did before this. So um, I've been at Spark for about a year and a half now. Um, before this, I worked at a company as like a solutions architect, which is kind of not like data science at all. Um, but you know, I don't regret that decision. I uh, learned about what I liked and I, what I don't like. And um, I definitely like working with uh, data and machine learning and that kind of stuff, which is what I um, did a lot of um, during my time in like grad school. Um, so happy to be back um, in that realm. Um, but yeah, so at Spark, um, my like general tasks are, you know, it, Day to day is different um, depending on what the priorities are and the time of the semester it is. But you know, in the beginning, I would say it's a lot of like project scoping and planning and meeting with clients just to make sure that um, what they want fits like what the client wants for their project fits in one of our tracks for Spark. Um, and then once that's all set, it's a lot of data collection, data preparation, and cleaning. Um, to like deliver to the student teams to be able to work with all that data. Um, yeah, data in the real world is messy and there's lots of cleaning. It doesn't come um, nice and prepared for all of you. So a lot of time is spent, you know, um, cleaning and preparing data. Um, and then, you know, as the projects are rolling, I spent a lot of time meeting with like the student teams and also sitting in during their client meetings when they meet with the client to, pre uh, to present their updates um, and then also work with them on like troubleshooting, if they run any issues, if they need more compute or access to the FCC, or maybe they um, are having issues or trouble trying to tackle one of the problems, maybe, um, you know, talking through the problem with them and maybe finding a different way to solve it. Um, and then another part, um, in between all of that is working on like Spark infrastructure, um, building out tools and docs to you know um, sustain all of the projects that we run, and also getting to work on um, some of the projects myself. So um, yeah. Um, also feel free to like stop or like interrupt me if you have any questions. And, um, happy to take them. But yeah, so um, one of the projects that I've been working on um, is the NAACP GBH Media Bias Project, uh, which uh, is very exciting, I think. So the goal of this project is to build this web application of proof of concept for GBH um, to see you know, what neighborhoods are covered the most and what types of articles um, are mentioned the most in like certain um, neighborhoods and within Boston. Um, so in Boston, there's, I think, 23 official neighborhoods, but there's even more sub neighborhoods. So like smaller um, like groups um, within those bigger neighborhoods that so that is not, there's no official number on, unfortunately. Um, so the there's different components for this project. There's software engineering, 
uh, machine learning topic modeling, and then machine learning like entity recognition, and then others uh, other uh, parts of the project that are on the backlog that haven't been um, dealt with yet. But uh, the piece that I have been working on um, recently has been the machine learning entity recognition. So um, we've been scraping articles from the GBH RSS feed, and the goal uh, with these articles is to um, extract you know, the locations from them. And then um, another, we have another team member working on the topic modeling part, which is based on this text of, um, that we've gathered, you know, what is the article about? It could be about sports, um, politics, um, architecture, whatever. Um, but the goal, the two different goals are to get the locations and then get the topics from those articles. So the pipeline basically goes as, First, given the um, blog of text to extract any of the locations mentioned in the article, and I just used um, a library to do that. Um, that's been trained on, pre-trained on news articles already, um, and it has a pretty successful uh, job. Just does, does a pretty good job of extracting those locations, and um, then given all those locations, pass it through the Google Geocoding API to get the uh, coordinates for it because the ultimate goal is to find out which neighborhood or which uh, census tract, which I think maybe you all have learned about the census geographies. Yes, no. Um, but uh, to get the neighborhood and to see um, the types of demographics that are most prevalent in those neighborhoods. But then after the geocoding, um, I use the census geocoder to get the exact census tract that it's part of, because then it gives um, more specific demographic breakdowns for um, each part. And then lastly is to call the census API to get the demographic breakdowns for each of the um, tracks um, for the location that's been mentioned. Um, I kind of went through that fast. Are there any questions? Or Confusion because okay. Um, yeah, so I merged a lot of data or used a lot of different data sets in different parts of this pipeline. So, first is the GBH RSS feed, which has been provided to us by our client, GBH. Um, and this is where I get all the article data from. And the next is the census data for all the demographic information that. Um, I'm interested in for each of the locations that are mentioned in the article. And then lastly is this Boston neighborhoods data, which maps the census tracts to the neighborhoods. Um, previously, the goal for this was to get sub-neighborhood mentions on, in the article text, but that doesn't exist. So we kind of had to um, pivot a little bit and you know figure out what we could do with what data was already out there, just yes. Uh, um, I just so it's in the RSS feed, so it's in a pretty like easy format. It's just um beautiful soup to collect all that data. I just in Selenium, I just feed it um the link for the RSS feed, and then um it's in like an XML format, and I just for whatever for the tags I'm interested in, I just pull that data. Yeah, and beautiful soup. Um, yeah, so for the census data, because we wanted to tie census data to um, specific Boston neighborhoods, but since the sub neighborhoods, they're not really defined and there's no um, official list and census data comes out every 10 years. So you have to continuously change it. Previously, I think the other teams have um, just built out uh, a list themselves like manually, which isn't very exact or um, efficient since every single time the census updates, you'd have to redo it again. Um, so just using the census tract, which is about, I think 2000 people per um, area and linking it to a neighborhood um, gives a better um, idea of like the demographic makeup for each of those um, neighborhoods. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just walk. 
walk through an example. So here we have an article about um, the Boston Marathon. Um, so it says, and you can see if you read like the first few lines that it has some mentions of like uh, places like Boston, Mar Boston, Hopkinton, Col Copley Square, um, or Copley. I'm not from the area, so I said it incorrectly. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so here's an article from GBH kind of recently. Um, and then walking through the pipeline that I had mentioned, we first, um, you know, pull out all of the locations that have been mentioned, which first we see are these three places, Hopkinton, Copley, and Boston. And then I kind of, but like in between, um, before getting the geolocations, because I have to feed it through uh, the Google API and there's an associated cost with that to cut back on costs, I've filtered out um, the locations such as like town names, state names, and um, yeah, so I just give it very specific uh, neighborhoods or like squares and things. So what we have left is Copley, and then we get a latitude longitude from that. And then with that, using the census uh, geocoder, I can get the tract for um, this location, which is here, 01. 0702, and then using the other data set to match um, Boston neighborhoods I mentioned, I can see that it's in Back Bay. Um, and then, so here's like the full output of everything. Um, but what's what we really just wanted is this better um, Yeah. So, are there, it's, that was kind of quick, but do you? Do you have any questions for me about anything? Yes. Uh, yeah, was it hard to gain access to like Google's API? No, it's it's very easy. Um, they also, if you use your um, BU email, I believe you get three hundred dollars of free credit. Um, specifically with the geocoding API, I think for a thousand requests, it's like five dollars. Um, so yeah, depending on like what you're trying to do, it's the three hundred dollars can go like the free credit can go pretty far, um, and I know AWS also has like free tier options for their services as well. Um, are there any other questions that I could answer? Yeah. Sorry. How long? Um, I would say. If I was able to sit down and just like dedicate time to this, maybe like a week, but since I have other like tasks and um, projects and stuff, it, it's been like very iterative throughout like the semester. Um, yeah, also, um, it's also lots of like back and forth with the um, other people that are working on the project and other stakeholders to make sure that like the output that I'm giving is what they wanted. And also throughout that process, it's, um, after figuring out like what we could do, that's also like changed. And what I presented is like the final, but I didn't really talk about the other um, iterations we had in the past. Were there any other questions? Or anything, it doesn't have to be about like this specifically, just be about data science and like uh, working. If anyone has any of those questions, yeah. Yeah, how do you run it to any on data? Yeah, Facebook, definitely not. You'll run into issues with their terms of service, and I wouldn't want um, to deal with Facebook lawyers. So, um, yeah, recently, though, for one of our projects, we've been trying to get Twitter data. And since they changed their CEOs and with like Elon Musk uh, now in charge, there's been lots of issues trying to get Twitter data. Um, but web scraping has always been on like that gray like area in line. But since we got specific access or uh, requests from our client to use our RSS feed, that's been pretty much like smooth. Um, I think it's definitely helpful, but feel like if we rely too much on it, um, 
that's that's where it's like bad because sometimes the output like I won't lie to you I use chat GPT um pretty regularly for like things just to, like if I have a question or like um it helps me like figure out my answer faster um but obviously I'm not solely relying on it I'm just using it to make things a little bit more efficient um but also have to recognize that like so it sometimes the output it gives is garbage and um you can't rely solely on that um but yeah does that kind of answer your question? Yep. I guess <clears throat> and it would depend on like, what are you interested in and maybe trying to find data sets that are related to that and like what questions you have like related to your interests that you want to answer and using that data, can you answer those questions? Um, and I mean, along the way, you'll probably run into issues and things like that and finding people who have knowledge in those like domains and like talking to them because then, you know, that may open like more doors for opportunity um, to, you know, like pursue research or work on a real world project or something. Um, definitely think Spark is a good place for that just because they have a lot of like real world like uh, client projects to work on, and I think there are a lot of interesting questions those projects like answer, especially in the uh, 506 like uh, tools for data science course. Um, a lot of those projects are working with like city councilors um, from Boston, and they have you know those issues like apply to all of us, right? We live in Boston. You all go to school in Boston, um, and yeah. Um, I think the Analyze Boston website, I don't know if you all experienced like used it before, has a lot of like interesting data out there um, about like where we all live and um, things that like are close to you, I feel like are the most interesting because they have the most um, real like uh, impact. Any other questions? Also, oh, I guess added to that, um, there are a lot of places that have like uh, competitions that you can um, participate in to just, you know, hone in your skills and practice a bit, um, like Kaggle, so if you want to participate. They're usually free. Any other questions I can answer? Or questions about Spark? Um, if anyone has any questions about those, I can also answer them. Yes. Um, well, so I guess I started out in a different, like, uh, I worked, before this, I worked at a company as a solutions architect, which is kind of different from this role because I was, like, client facing and doing demos for people. Um, but um, I would say that the like research and the projects I'd worked on during school really helped um, you know, lead me here and just having um, interest in like other um, fields that aren't just like data science or computer science um, to help, you know, um, make myself more around, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's on CS506. Um, I think the name has changed, but before it was like tool, tools for data, computational tools for data science. So in that class, you um, get assigned, you get paired to like one of our Spark projects and you get a project manager and a technical engineer to um, help you like work through any issues and things like that, but also during the course, you learn um, different methods to apply your projects. So it's not just the project. We have um, other courses, like the practicum courses, where the main focus is just like working on your project and get a lot of lab time to work on that too during class, but you also have like other guest lecturers to learn about um, other topics and things that aren't necessarily covered in like SCS or 
the CS curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think our applications for summer just open. So if you go to um, bees.app or just visit our website, you can you'll get um, directed to that and you can apply. Uh, we also, I believe, are accepting in, um, applications for fall as well. So there are positions for like project managers where you like um, organize and run the meetings for the student teams, um, tech engineers, which is just usually a more senior student who gives um, technical advice and like troubleshooting. And then there are also projects in our internship program. So you can apply to be a technical teammate and work like directly on a project. Um, which is, I guess, where the NAACP project that I mentioned, that's where it lays, it's in our internship program. Um, and then there are also other uh, other roles for us for that like like ambassadors where um, you get to um, you know build community and work on like creating events for like space and stuff and um, find speakers to come and talk to during our tech talks. Any other questions? I would say I, I guess there are a few. I also worked in like a research lab and I found that I really liked doing that research type of work. Um, it was a lot of, it was working with like computer science professors, but also biology professors. Um, but I didn't really do anything about biology because I don't know anything about biology. <laughs> it was like building uh, tools um, for biologists to be able to like look and understand their data. Um, so, um, that definitely helps um, just working with a professor. Um, other projects, I don't know if the, if the CS program does this, but I had like a capstone project I had to complete for my degree. And um, that definitely made me interested in like machine learning and everything because that was related to like computer vision. And um, I had never got an opportunity to work on a project like that before in my classes. So um, I was really appreciative of that. Um, yeah. um, other things are like more accessible. Like one project I worked on was um, analyzing like tweets. Um, now it might be a little bit difficult to do because of the Twitter API, but back then it was like um, looking at the uh, sentiment of tweets. It was more positive or negative based on like the text. Yeah. Any other questions I could answer? Are you all like fresh first years or is there like a mix? A mix, yeah. And then are you, are you all data science students then or like computer science or like other, what other majors are? You can just shout them out, <laughs> it's okay. Oh, journalism? Oh, that's, yeah, we have um, the XCC class, which is the um, Justice Media Co-Lab, which works with like journalism students and computing students to like, do data driven journalism and usually by the end they have like an article that's published in, in the paper or whatever organization we're working with. That's pretty cool. Um, any other majors? Chemistry? Oh, so, <laughs> oh, so uh, what made you take this class? Um, we can be used this a lot, but I just think it's data. It's like good, more like chemistry labs are looking to hire mm -hmm. data scientists. Yeah, I would agree with that. I have a friend who's doing her PhD, and it's like her PhD is in um, machine learning for physical sciences. So she, uh, she works on a lot with like a lot of chemists and like building machine learning models to like help them analyze everything. I don't understand the chemistry, but it's helpful, yeah. Yeah. Um, 